I'm hoping the Big Ten has to modify their system for us. <laughs> it's probably like getting great 10 sandpaper rubbed on your face every day. I mean, we say it all the time, whether, you know, there's two types of turds, you're a sinker or you're a floater, but you're still a turd, right? I mean, um, we're, we're, we are about players and players playing the plays and not necessarily the plays. Welcome to the Varsity Club Podcast. My name is Derek Peterson. Uh, this podcast is coming to you semi-live this week. I mean, it's live for us. It's not live for you, depending on when you're listening to it. We are we are across the street, literally across the street from Lucas Oil Stadium, the site of the 2021 Big Ten Football Media Days. They are back after a one-year hiatus. Uh, I am here, Chris Schmidt is here, and my guest for this week, Erin Sorensen, is obviously also here because she's on this podcast. Erin, hello. How are you? I'm good. I I'm just keep crossing my fingers for this recording that a car doesn't drive by because you will hear it on this podcast. So just for anyone listening, just you are with us. You are in this experience. So cars, random noises. Well, at least there's not. This. There was a um, one of the places across the street from our hotel last night. There was an <laughs> alarm going off for like hours on end. So at least at least we're not there. And if you want to know what the alarm was for, which means they're all going to start happening now. A Rolls Royce building that uh, apparently a dealership has like a spot where they keep some of their Rolls Royces, and that was the alarm that was going off. So no small feat what was going on. Um, so we're gonna just talk about Big Ten Media Day stuff. Talk about takeaways, um, some interesting stuff that we heard, mm-hmm. sort of um, big picture stuff. But first, because it's my podcast, I would like to say <laughs> that I just don't understand what the hell Oklahoma's doing. Um, as an alum of the university, it makes me very sad that they are trying to leave the Big 12. It makes me upset that they are hitching their wagon to Texas, which if Nebraska has taught us anything, it's that doing exactly that will lead you down a path that you don't want down eventually. And like Nebraska, in this grand scheme of things, looks a, a little good. a little validated right now well, because everything that they said, like, "Hey, we're, we're we're worried about what's happening here." This is what was ha- this is what they were worried about, and now the Big Twelve is falling apart because Texas wants to wield its Texas might all over the place. And I just don't understand why Oklahoma is just sort of tagging along. Yeah. Um, we got into an argument off pod. It was not an argument. It was a conversation off pod uh, at, at dinner tonight. Someone was like, well, you know, they're just trying to get out in front of an eventual Big 12 collapse. And as Ooh, my see, laptop goes you. off. I told you. I told you all kinds of stuff happening. It was me. My, uh, my computer's getting upset with you because it's currently overheating. They, uh, they're trying to get out ahead of a Big, a Big 12 collapse that is that looks like it was going to come. I mean... If you paid attention to the Big 12, it was going to come anyway. And, and like five years from now, let's say they just stick around in the Big 12 five years from now, they want to be in a position where they can pick their next home as mm-hmm. opposed to being forced into a new home, to which I would say that's insane because the University of Oklahoma is not going to get pigeonholed into the Mountain West Conference when the Big 12 uh, Could you imagine? <laughs> just goes away. Like Oklahoma, regardless of... Today, tomorrow, a year from now, five years from now, is going to have every single Power 5 conference lined up at its door saying, hey, this is why we want you in our conference. I just don't understand why. Well, I do. Money. So from, from, you know, from a, a purely financial health standpoint for the university, I understand the move. As an alum of the university, I'm pissed off right now. And um, it'll be interesting to see how the Big Ten handles all of this because you know like they certainly view themselves as as the uh the one b to the sec's one a when it comes to the autonomy five conferences they certainly view themselves as an equal and not you know the pac-12 of the power five level Mm -hmm. and so as the sec sort of basically turns into the kid with the biggest stick on the playground um it'll be curious to see what the big 10 does because they don't want to be left behind so Notre Dame, where are you at? We'll see. I, uh, this whole thing is like, I love I love conference realignment, especially when it comes to Twitter, because it's really when the app is at its best. However, I will say the frustrating part for me is I just don't, I, we talked about this off podcast as well, but I will just say I don't understand 
Oklahoma in the SEC. I just think it's such an atrocious fit, not because I don't think Oklahoma couldn't find its own footing in some way in another conference, wherever it might go. But I've always long believed if the if the Big 12 dissolves or if Oklahoma looks elsewhere, the Big 10 would be a really great fit for Oklahoma. Now, there's a little bit of Nebraska homerism coming through with that because it's selfishly, I think, a great thing to have Nebraska and Oklahoma reunited to a degree. But aside from that, I just think it's sincerely a better fit. But, you know, Texas has somehow weaseled its way into this conversation, and I'm tired of it. But I will say, yes, Nebraska is probably feeling a little vindicated right now. However, all of the people who wanted Nebraska to go back to the Big 12 last fall, you cannot be feeling as vindicated right now because y'all would have been in a big old mess. Well, this is the reason that was never a tenable conversation in the first place. Y'all would have been a big old mess. Because that would have been bad. I mean, even a year ago, the Big 12 didn't look stable. Like you can you can quibble with the Big 10 decision making, and if you want to talk about Kevin Warren, who uh, made his first sort of big media day's appearance today. Um, Thursday when we're recording this we could talk about Kevin Warren if you wanted to but like I guess you, I mean you could quibble with things that he did didn't do said didn't say a year ago but the Big Ten undeniably is a more stable um, situation to be in than the Big 12 is and that you know that's true today that was true a year ago <clears throat> um, so yeah that's that. we don't have to you know we don't have to believe <laughs> that point if, this will probably change 15 more times by the time this podcast gets posted, I hope so not. we can uh, we can <clears throat> we can move on to Nebraska stuff. Um, Aaron, we got to hear from Scott Frost. We got to hear from Trev Alberts, Nebraska's new athletic director. We got to hear from Austin Allen, uh, fifth year junior tight end, Ben Stilley and Deontay Williams, super senior um, mm-hmm. defensive end and defensive back, respectively. What was I guess what was your what was your takeaway from the day? What did you just think overall of of the day for Nebraska? I actually thought it was a pretty good day. Just overall, it felt like uh, the media darling truly. And I'm not just talking of Nebraska. I'm talking of the whole day. It was really Trev Alberts. He was impressing people all up and down Radio Row. He was giving time to just about anyone who asked for it, and everyone who left conversations left feeling. Like they'd had a very personable one-on-one um, intentional conversation with him. Very honest. He, I, I was able to listen to a couple of the uh, radio shows that he was doing. And I mean, he was just, he was having a good time. And like, I think that translated. But then not only that, he was very much, his messaging very much mirrored the messaging of Scott Frost. You could just tell there was a cohesive effort in place to have some of the same things be shared. Uh, one of the things that we talked about off podcast, but you know, Trev Alberts had mentioned that there are things that he wants to take off of Scott Frost's plate that he was doing that weren't football related. Frost said something similar about how he was doing things that weren't football related that he shouldn't have been doing. So it just felt like there were conversations that happened walking into Big Ten Media Days that were like, we're going to really push this. And so they walked in very cohesive. And in my opinion, it felt very informative. It was, it was really a very uh, quiet day for Nebraska. They did not leave as the uh, big social media. Uh, there were no social media blunders, but there were also really nothing. There was like nothing really huge and stand out, but it was just a solid performance. Yeah, and I do use performance a little bit because to a degree that is what media days is. Yeah. But yeah. The stuff that stood out was, it, it like, it stood out in a way that like everybody has been it, it was just stuff that people have wanted to hear from Nebraska and to finally hear it. I think that's why it stood out. So like to hear Trev Alberts say he had probably the quote of the day where, you know, he was asked, how does Nebraska get back to the level of play that it was at 30 years ago back in the 90s? And, and right off the cuff, Trev says, well, we're not going to get there by talking about mm. um, what we used to do 30 years ago because no one cares right now. And he said, we're going to focus on the fundamentals and we're going to focus on the details. And you talked about quiet. I think that was really the main takeaway for me. You know, in my four years here, I don't feel like I've ever really been able to say that Nebraska was operating as a well-oiled machine as its athletic department. It's always been creaky. It's always been a little helter-skelter. It's always been like, you're like waiting. You're like, it's like, 
it's like 1137 at night and mm-hmm. you're like, can I shut my laptop or is something crazy going to happen? <laughs> you're kind of always like on the edge of your seat waiting for like, okay, what's the next Nebraska thing that they're going to do? Today felt, it felt um, like they checked the ego at the door and it was very business-like. It was, like you said, quiet. Mm-hmm. Um, there were, I'm not going to say, I don't know this, so I can't say it, but it just felt like it felt like Trev Alberts came in and had sort of a calming effect on the whole operation. Mm-hmm. And everybody was on the same page. There wasn't, you know, these big grandiose statements that Frost has given at previous media days. He didn't say anything outlandish. He didn't say anything that could be misconstrued and used against him. Um, he was like dapping it up with Bob Stoops, who was randomly... In Indianapolis yeah, and, and James Franklin, and he was being chummy with, with other Big Ten coaches, and it just seemed like a, a slightly different Nebraska. Um, but for a team that is talking about, we need to focus in on the details and the fundamentals, and we need to be, um, we need to execute well. They were, they had it down to a T today. It felt like. Yeah, I mean, it just. And I think, you know, really at the end of the day, when you think of things like media days, that's really what it should be. It needs to just be kind of this kickoff for your season. You don't really need media days to be where all of the, like, disruption to your season, like, really starts. Like, you don't need people putting a target on your back, I guess, is more of what I mean, right off the get-go. This is a this is an opportunity a day to really build some goodwill and just kind of kick things off if you will on a on a pretty light note I mean yeah there's always there's tougher topics that get brought up I mean name image and likeness were certainly at the forefront of a lot of conversations COVID-19 was as well and one of the things that Frost did say he wasn't willing to comment on whether he believed games should be forfeits or uh, postponements he wasn't willing to comment on that but then he did in kind of an indirect way, go back to that then by saying he feels that vaccines are the pathway forward for a complete season, essentially. And I'm paraphrasing it. He said something more closely along the lines of like, to have a to have an uninterrupted season, vaccinations are the path and that they would be educating their players to get vax or like to know what they to know what they need to know about the vaccines if they, you know, go get vaccinated. And so those you know those are heavier topics i guess if you if you want to call them that but i mean because everything else i think went so smoothly those were easy to kind of talk about as well because everything else just sort of felt pretty easy too i think when i guess my point is is when you don't make everything else dramatic when everything else seems like we walked in with a plan when the harder questions come up that are going to require a little bit more thought for an answer it feels very planned even then. It feels like we didn't walk into this and answer this for the first time. We already knew what we were going to say. And it felt like Nebraska knew what it was going to say in most situations coming into this event. I'm not going to lie. I got kind of tired of hearing the NIL questions. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Frost maybe did a little bit too because he just kept getting asked about stuff. And And I don't say that because I'm like, I don't like the current situation or I'm not, you know, behind athletes getting paid. Austin Allen, and I think Ben Stilley probably said this too, that it seems like a lot of people don't know what's going on, don't know what they're doing. And so for right now, I'm just kind of like tired of the, yeah, well, we don't know. I'm just kind of, I was like, let's, let's talk about some other stuff. We've already talked about it. There's, a, stuff there's a couple of good, I will always say there's different ways that people ask questions that are good. And there was one person who was going around asking about NIL and the way that they're asking the athletes about their kind of their opinions was instead of saying, hey, what have you maybe done or what have you personally, you know, experienced? They said, what have you seen others do that has stood out to you? Like what's been the wildest offer that you've seen so far or what has been the most astronomical amount of money you've seen attached to an offer so far? And what was interesting about that is you you heard different perspectives because for Ben Stilley he was looking at well what his first reaction was the Miami like the Miami stuff like the different deals that were happening there and then oh didn't Alabama's quarterback get something kind of bonkers so like he was looking at 
those. And so it was kind of fun to hear like what deals they were keenly aware of happening elsewhere. I thought that kind of was fun. So there was ways that people asked the question that was that was in, interesting and entertaining. I would say I agree with you when it was, well, what are you doing? What are you up to? Unfortunately, right now, the answer to many people's surprise, I think we're finding is, well, not much because that was sort of what yeah. was going to happen. Yeah. What was the most interesting thing you heard today? Aside from, aside from you Scott. You don't get to talk about the gopher situation thing on the big board. Oh. <sighs> That was good. I was going to say... That's where I thought you were going. Aside from Scott Frost and his uh, comment on vaccinations, which I did... I think that took a lot of people by surprise. And um, I think it was a pleasant surprise to hear him speak a little bit more candidly about it because he has been pretty... Like, when it's been brought up in the past, he's quickly shut that conversation down. So I think I was surprised by that, um, but not in like... Well, he hasn't quickly shut it down. He's just not... He just hasn't really... He hasn't taken like, a side one way or the well, other. Right, I don't want to. So it doesn't. It doesn't allow the opportunity for a follow up. I want to be careful. I don't want to imply that he has shut it down. Like shut it down. Like oh, I don't want to talk about this. I just mean like it sort of has ended the conversation because he's he's typically given an answer that is difficult to follow up because it's just as simple. I don't want to have that conversation. I don't want to like. So what? Well, it's it's. He does more, the thing where he says uh, people that are above my head are, are having those yeah. conversations. Yeah. So to hear him kind of talk, I think a little bit more candidly was it was interesting. Um, another one that I always find to be um, a person I find to be fascinating is Austin Allen, and listening to him talk about like he feels his run blocking is is up to par so to use golf terms he's like it's it's a par it's not much it needs to get better and he was explaining the differences between him and Travis Vokalek and how Vokalek is like a really really strong blocker and that's really his thing but how he is more traditionally like a he's gonna go up for the ball and catch it and so he was explaining some of the like benefits and negatives of both of that but how they both play off of each other and that's a good thing uh he he talked very openly about the errors that the offense has to clean up and how he has to be a better leader that when he sees a running back holding the ball, you know, way out here and not tucking it high and tight and holding on to it, that he needs to be better about not just going, well, that's not my job to tell him. And so I think you're seeing a captain being built right in front of us with Austin Allen, but he, he was probably, in my opinion, one of the most, um, forthcoming of the three players as far as his thoughts on things today that's interesting what he says about travis because i remember when when vocalek got to campus one of the things that they talked about was that he was a, a pure pass catcher and they really needed to work on uh him as a as a run blocker because he was pretty raw there um but i mean hey Beckton's done well developing people like austin allen is is about to be a captain and he's mm-hmm. He's the leading returning receiver for Nebraska, which is wild to say about somebody that had 200 receiving yards last year. Um, a couple of interesting things, like Scott Frost brought up Nick Henrich unprompted when he was at, I mean, he was kind of prompted, but he wasn't asked specifically about Henrich. He was asked about players uh, who he's looking forward to seeing potentially make that next jump, and he said Nick Henrich was the first name that came to mind. Mm-hmm. said he was really looking forward to seeing him play inside linebacker. said that um, him and Luke Reimer and Chris Kolarovich are, are going to have to be the guys for them, which wasn't anything new. I mean, Nick Henrich was, I think, my number 10 on my most intriguing list for that exact reason. Like, he's going to have that opportunity now. Um, but it was cool to, to see him get um, some unprompted, unsolicited love from the coach. That was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, ben Silly said that Oliver Martin, pound for pound, is the strongest person on the team, which was interesting. So the, uh, the offseason um, cult growing of Oliver Martin is uh, mm-hmm. alive and well. Oliver Martin definitely is like becoming that cult favorite at the moment. He's uh he's killing it with the with the weight training. Um, I thought Frost's response to being picked fifth in the Big Ten West was uh was interesting. Let me get this quote. So he says, "We're picked where we deserve to be. When we've earned it, we should be picked higher than that." That being said, if predictions were right, we wouldn't even have to play the games. My second year, I think we were picked for no good reason. Picked first for no good reason, excuse me. I like where we're at. If that puts a chip on our kids' shoulders, that's a good thing. So, like, this is interesting to me, which is probably not to other people, but it's interesting to me because the last time we were at Big Ten Media Days, 
Nebraska was picked to win the West. Yeah. Can you believe that? How I mean, it's been two years. Two yeah. years later, yep. we are back at Big Ten Media Days for the first time. It just kind of works out narratively. That car driving by is agreeing um, 100% with all of this. Two years later, we're back at Big Ten Media Days. He has a lot of the same pieces mm-hmm. on the team that he had two years ago. And Nebraska's picked fifth. And it seems like they are more comfortable now with where they are and where the expectations are than they were then. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's easy for Frost to say picked first for no good reason. They weren't actively trying to shut down UCF year two comparisons two years ago. Um, so that's fun. But it, I, it just felt like there's a there's more of a quiet confidence with this team. Mm-hmm. And... and Quiet in the sense, not in the sense of like they're not talking about it because Frost talked about yeah. he feels good about the wide receivers. He feels good about where Adrian is at, specifically a quarterback. He thinks his two tight ends can be NFL guys. Defensively, they are not shy about talking about what their expectations are. Their expectations are sky high. But they're, I don't really know how to explain it. There's, there just seems to be less of a less of an in-your-face kind of confidence. Like, there's no sense whatsoever of the the kind of frost that said, get us now because you can't get us later. Like, Mm -hmm. that seems like it's gone. You agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of talked about coming into this about the players that were selected for this, and... Um, To be clear, Frost did say this, and I have a point to what you're just saying. Um, But Frost did just say, to to clarify for anyone who might be wondering, Adrian wanted to go home. He hasn't been home much in the last, obviously, year and a half with the pandemic, wanted to go home. This week was an opportunity for players to do that. So Frost had no issue with that. He was allowed to go home. They brought three other people. He said if Adrian had been around, he would more than likely come. Um, But... When you look at Deontay and Ben and Austin, you definitely get a very specific type of attendee. And I said this to Ben, oftentimes the attendees end up being captains. There's a reason that they're selected. They're often on the short list of captain. Like th- that's just because if they have the respect to come to something like this, they're usually pretty high on the list of who on the people on the team would consider. You have two six-year well, yeah, seniors. I mean, if they're and, coming to this, they're the voice of the team. And yeah. if you're the voice of the team, you're a captain. And we kind of noticed, like, well, why didn't, say, somebody like Cam Taylor Britt come? And I don't think that it's that Cam Taylor Britt couldn't have been here and been an absolute um, perfect representation for Nebraska. That's not it, it at all. The thing where I think the three selections, and this is going to your point, is they were very much kind of – presenting that same unified we're not here to make the get us now because if you don't like this is your chance to get us thing they were very much I mean Ben heard for the first time that Nebraska was picked fifth in the west on Thursday that was the first time he heard it and he told the person this is the first time I'm hearing it but basically that is where we are like that is just what it is and I think when you have realistic answers that kind of don't gloss things over it's just it is what it is it allows the focus then for once to fully just stay on what your team is able to accomplish and less on why are you talking this up why are you blowing smoke why are you doing all this stuff and that's the thing where I think they get themselves into trouble sometimes is a little bit too much smoke without having sort of everything to back it up they're, they're not doing that right now. And the three that they brought really, I would say, kind of kept the messaging in check. What do you think of the sort of narrative, the storyline that um, Nebraska's skill position talent, specifically a wide receiver, hmm. is as good as it has been under Frost? Do you buy that? Do you think that uh... that's a little bit of like trying to boost confidence a little bit I before the season? I think it's a season. little bit trying to boost confidence, although I will say, Deontay kept telling us that Samori Torre is like one of the most difficult people for him to defend. I mean, he's obviously, he's facing off with him the most, but he's like, he's good. He's really good. 
So I feel like Deontay would tell us truthfully. I feel like he would be honest. I I don't think he's gonna he's gonna say because I mean, in the same vein, he was saying Xavier uh, Xavier Betts is really good, but um, he said they can have one of the best wide receiver groups in the Big Ten. But see, this is why I trust what Deontay was saying. Because he said that Xavier doesn't really realize how good he is yet. Like, it hasn't switched on for him yet. He's like, once he realizes how good he is and all of the potential, he's going to be unstoppable. He just hasn't switched that mindset on yet where he, like, realizes that about himself. And so he was asked, like, what? how do you change that? He's like, experience, age, that just realizing you belong. Like... So you hear him saying, like, Xavier has all of the talent. He could be that guy, but he's not yet because he's he just doesn't yet have the, like, full confidence in himself. But then, so when he's talking about Samore, I have the tendency to want to believe him more that Samore is as good as he's pitching him to be because if he's going to be so openly honest about where he feels Xavier is right now, then it feels like, why would he be blowing smoke about Samori, it feels like, yeah, there's potential, like, really strong talent right there. And he talked about Deontay came from, you know, a JUCO background. So for him, he knows that chip on the shoulder that um, Samori is coming into Nebraska with. He wants to prove himself. He wants to show people how good he is. So he's one where I'm like, I'm excited to see him, but if they're even half as good as what they're pitching for him, like, that group could be a surprise piece to this offense this this coming year. Yeah. I mean, the fact of the matter is, it's going to depend on the guy getting them the football. Correct. What the ceiling is. Um, but Frost has just been so steadfast in this notion that they have the deepest, most talented wide receiver room that he's had yet at Nebraska. Mm-hmm. That the more he says it, the more I believe him. Um, because like when you look at it on paper, it makes sense. I mean, I asked him, Samori can do the stuff that a typical slot receiver in this offense needs to do Mm -hmm. but he also has the physical profile that they haven't had in that position and frost is like yeah he's gonna give us a big catch radius over the middle of the field yeah he's gonna give us speed in the middle of the field still he's gonna be able to block outside linebackers in in the run game which for as great as wando robinson was he was not a great blocker because he was just small he He was able to get moved around don't let me forget i need to tell you a block story in just a second um so like you put Samori at the slot, and then I think Oliver Martin is going to be better. As does that car. <laughs> I think Oliver Martin is going to be better than people are expecting him. Most people are expecting him. Yeah. Um, Frost was like super clear that he's really happy with the progress that Omar Manning has made and the work that Omar Manning has done, <sighs> and said yeah. that he's been locked in with the team this off season and, and throughout the summer and. and that that changes things quickly because if you if you have those three guys at the top of your depth chart, then somebody like Xavier can just sort of figure it out, and mm-hmm. he doesn't have to be. He doesn't, he doesn't have to be, have to be immediately too much relied too on. Soon. Yeah. And then you've got Alante Brown, and you've got Will Nixon, and you've got the walk-on kid that they just added, whose name I'm blanking on, and you've got Levi Falk, who's still here that I keep forgetting about, and you've got these other guys, freshmen like Latrell Neville, like. They're deep. Yeah. It's 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 not you know, it's not hard to talk yourself into believing what Frost is pitching. Now again, at the end of the day it comes down to who's getting them the football. Mm-hmm. But, you know Well, the it, person getting them the football is also gonna have to get the footballs to the tight ends, and I just can't forget to tell you this because it goes back to your question on what was the most surprising thing I heard, and okay, I can't for believe it. I forgot to tell you this. Austin Allen when talking about Travis Vokalek, said that they sometimes refer to him as a bonus right guard. Apparently he's that good. Really? This was a guy that was raw blocking when he got here. They had to teach him how to block. Cool. <laughs> cool. That's good. Right? Um, another fun fact, Deontay Williams' nickname is 8-Ball because he loves pool. Yeah, and I, I walked in on that like very much. Like, was he saying he likes that he, nickname? He does. Okay. Yeah, he, just I wasn't. I heard like he enjoys billiards. Okay. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's somebody is gonna is gonna weave that story of of like he wins it or he loses it for you mm-hmm. because he is he's definitely a and like we joked with with Bill Carollo, the head of Big Ten officiating, we joked that we were gonna have to talk to him and Deontay about targeting. 
like Deontay Williams is definitely he he's gonna help you or he's he's gonna hurt you a little bit with mm-hmm. just the heat seeking missile that he is. So that was interesting. Um, any other quick nuggets that you have from today? I'm looking through all of my stuff. I mean, one thing that I heard a little bit of and I thought I'd offer some perspective is Austin Allen brought up Thomas Fedoni. So did Frost, if I'm not remiss. But I know Austin Allen did and just kind of talked about how he has a ton of potential. He obviously had an unexpected spring with an injury. But, um, I mean, it sounds like things are going well. For him, at least as in his recovery, but uh, I just why I said I wanted to offer some in, like perspective is he was actually participating as a coach in Ben Stilley and Jojo Doman's camp that they hosted recently, and I mean he obviously moving around in just a situation like that is very different than football moving around, but like he was moving around, and I mean that was a great sign. He uh, like when 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 you say like he attacked his rehab process. He like, he like we're talking like Adrian Peterson coming back from ACL in six months like attacked mm-hmm. his rehab process. It's incredible to see because he was out at, I, I feel like a, I feel like he was at a Friday Night Lights camp moving around and like demonstrating drills for people. And I looked at Greg Smith and I was like, it doesn't look like he had ACL surgery a couple of freaking months ago, weeks ago, whenever it was. And Greg was like, yep. I mean, he that that's he uh. He was not happy about the injury, and he no. was like, nope, we're going to get to work. And, and somebody like Will Honus, it doesn't seem like they're going to have him. Frost didn't have a timetable for him. He seemed kind of sad about it when he talked about the linebackers. He said, we're going to need the other three guys, um, which may be foreshadowing. Maybe that's reading too much into what he said. But when it comes to Fedoni, he said there's definitely hope for Thomas. Yeah. And I think that's a testament to, uh, to just how aggressively he attacked his rehab process, which, I mean... Good for him. He's also a young kid, so it's probably pretty easy. <laughs> probably pretty easy. Seems like a pogo stick. He gets knocked down and he bounces right back up. Right. I just thought that was kind of cool to hear him talk about. Like Austin was basically saying, the biggest adjustment for him has truly just been he needed to just get adjusted to the college game. He just needed to settle in, and that was something that he just wasn't used to. And so, I mean, it's great to hear him. You know, talk about him like that. And I'm looking at the tight end room right now, and I mean. I think when we talk about Travis Vokalek next to Austin Allen, and I think that's why it was so fun to listen to Austin talk about, like, their differences, but, like, also when he talks about that room, speaking of Thomas Fedoni, is they obviously have recruited really, really tall tight ends, and for, and for, in Allen's perspective, he's like, it does open up for someone like Adrian more opportunities, because we can reach over defenders, and we can be, if we're in the right spot, if we're doing our job, and we're going where we're supposed to, and running our routes correctly, uh, and we're blocking when we're supposed to, we should make that game easier, and we have the height to add to it, because yeah, he was talking about the height in this whole thing, and you have Vokalek, who's 6'6", um, Fedoni is 6'6", Austin Allen is 6'9", I mean, it is just a tall, tall group. James Carney is 6'5". Um, the runt of the group. AJ Rollins is 6'6". Six, six. I mean, it's just Chris Hickman, which is back at tight end. Or six, what, he's 6'7"? 6'5". Six, six, five. Six, five. Okay, so, yeah. Well. So, but I mean, they're all just giants. They could go start a basketball team. Well, Austin said, um, he was talking about Wingspan? Just sort of the, uh, <laughs> him being in awe of being at Lucas Oil Stadium and mm-hmm. being on the field and being at, at media days. He's like, when I was younger, I thought I was going to be a basketball player because he was so tall. Yep. So that's why. Which, well, really quick, if you haven't read the Hale Varsity yearbook, I recommend it because that is one thing is for a lot of these players, and actually I, I'm, I'm glad that you, this is probably. You're, you're telling me that Jacob Padilla found a local person and then found a basketball angle for the story on that local person? Shocked. Shocked, I tell you. I am shocked. I will say this was kind of cool. Um, before the Nebraska players took their spots to at the podiums to talk with the media, Seamus McKnight, who is one of Nebraska's sports information directors, looked at them because they are all NFL hopefuls. They all have dreams of potentially playing professionally if it pans out for them. He looked at them and said, this will be similar to what an NFL media day landscape would look like. So just view it as training for that. And it was kind of cool because you saw all of them sort of see it as, oh, this is just further practice and opportunity to, you know, 
get better at the thing that I want someday. And I, I don't know why that kind of just stood out to me, but it was a cool moment just to kind of watch, I guess, the, uh, that little like light bulb go off for them of like, oh, that's kind of cool. So that's cool. Seamus gets a shout out on the podcast. Seamus gets a shout out on First the podcast. First Seamus shout out for the show. He also did take a photo of my tweet being uh, shown on Big Ten Network, so he gets two shout-outs on the show. <laughs> Good job, Seamus. <laughs> we will, uh, I think we both need to go to sleep, so we're we going to wrap it up. This is late on a Thursday night, so we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, keep reading HailVarsity.com. There'll be plenty of stuff from this weekend. Uh, we'll, there will continue to be stuff from this mm-hmm. weekend. Erin has... Her own podcast with Sasha Durkin, the Mind Your Own podcast. Subscribe to that. It's really good. Leave him a five-star review or a one-star review. I don't care. It's not my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe to all the other Hail Varsity, Hail Varsity. That's what I get. Hail Varsity podcast offerings. We are a proud part of the Herd App Media Network. Subscribe to Hail Varsity if you haven't already. Aaron referenced the yearbook. Go get that if you don't have it already. Lots of ways that you can get Hail Varsity content in front of your eyeballs or... I guess in earbuds or AirPods or headphones or whatever people use nowadays. Um, We'll be back next week. Thanks, guys. A Huda Media Production.